the United States of America. Rashid is my chief of staff. I had uh, I had no inkling. I thought we were coming over, Michelle, to for you, Jill, and Brock, and I to a couple of senior staff to to toast one another um, and uh, say what a what an incredible journey it's been. Mr. President, uh, you got right uh, the part about my uh, leaning on Jill, but I've also leaned on you um, and a lot of people in this room. I look around the room and I see great friends like uh, like Ted Kaufman, who's been uh, so much wisdom. Guys like Mel Monzak. I mean, I look around here and I'm startled. I keep seeing people I don't expect. Madam President, how are you? Mr. President, look at my new boss over there. Uh, um, but you know, uh, I get a lot of credit I don't deserve to state the obvious. Um, and um, because I've always had somebody to lean on. Um, from back that time in 1972, when the accident happened, I leaned on, uh, and I mean this in a literal sense, Chris knows this, Dodd knows this, and Mel knows this, and Ted knows this. I leaned on my son's bow and hunter. Um, I continue to lean on Hunter, who continues to, uh, in a bizarre kind of way, raise me. I mean, I've leaned on them. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Mr. President, you observed early on that uh, when either one of my boys would walk in the room, they'd walk up and say, Dad, what can I get you? Dad, what do you need? Um, and then Jill came along and uh, she saved our life. She, uh, no man deserves one great love, let alone two. And, um, but everybody knows here I am Jill's husband. Everybody knows that uh, I love her more than she loves me. Uh, with good reason. And she gave me the most precious gift, the love of my life, the life of my love, my daughter Ashley. And I continue to lean on the family. The president, you kidding me once. Uh, um, you heard that uh, in the preparation for the two debates, uh, vice presidential debates that I had, only had two, um, that Bo and Hunt would be the last people in the room and Bo would say, look at me, Dad, look at me, remember, remember home base, remember. So, and the Secret Service can tell you, Mr. President, that uh, Bo and Hunt and Ashley continue to have to corral me. We are in one of the national parks and I was climbing up on top of a bridge to jump off the bridge with a bunch of young kids, and I hear my son yelling, Dad, get down, now. And I just started laughing so hard I couldn't stop. And I said, I was just gonna do a flip off, full gainer off here. He said, Dad, the Secret Service doesn't want you up there, Dad. Look at me, Dad. <laughs> you know, so we've never figured out who the father is in this family. And, um, Mr. President, uh, uh, you know that uh, with good reason, um, there is no power in the vice presidency. Matter of fact, I just did for Nancy Pelosi's daughters who have readings of the Constitution. You probably did one for her. And they had me read the provisions relating to the vice presidency in the Constitution. And there is no inherent power, nor should there be. But Mr. President, you have uh, you have more than kept uh, 
your commitment to me uh, uh, by saying that you wanted me to, uh, to help govern. President's line often, other people don't hear it that often, but when someone say, can you get Joe to do such and such, he says, I don't do his schedule, he doesn't do mine. Every single thing you've asked me to do, Mr. President, um, you have uh, trusted me to do. Um, and that is a, uh, that's a remarkable thing. Uh, I don't think, according to, uh, I see the President of Georgetown here as well, I don't think according to the presidential and vice presidential scholars, that kind of uh, relationship has existed. I mean, for real. It's all you, Mr. President. It's all you. The reason why when you send me around the world, nothing gets, as my mom would say, gets missed between the cup and the lip is because they know when I speak, I speak to you. And it's been easy, Mr. President, because uh, we uh, not only have the same uh, political philosophy and ideology. Um, I tell everybody, and I've told them from the beginning, and I'm not saying this to re reciprocate. I've never known a president, and few people I've ever met in my whole life, I can count on less than one hand, who've had the integrity and the decency and the sense of uh, other people's uh, needs. <coughs> like you do. I know you're upset when I told the story about when Hunt and I were worried that uh, Bo would have to, uh, that he would, as a matter of honor, decide he had to step down as Attorney General while he was fighting his battle because he had aphasia. He was losing his ability to speak, and he didn't want to ever be in a position where, to him, everything was about duty and honor. And I said, uh, and he may resign. I don't know. I just have a feeling he may. And Hunt and I had talked about this. And I said, he doesn't have any other income, but we're all right because Hunt's there and I can sell the house. We're having a private lunch like we do once a week. And this man got up, came over, grabbed me by the shoulders, and looked me in the eye and said, don't you sell that house. You love that house. I said, it's no big deal, Mr. President. He said, I'll give you the money. We'll give you the money. Promise me. Promise me. You won't sell that house. I remember when Ashley, Mr. President, we were in the Oval, and Ashley was in an elevator. And the elevator plummeted to the, she was with a group of people, I don't just, I forget which building in Philadelphia, and it plummeted to the ground. And immediately the service was worried that, you know, she may have been badly hurt. And I got up to take the call, and you didn't let up until you made sure your service followed through and made sure everything was all right. But you know, Mr. President, um, you know, we kid about uh, both about marrying up. We both did that kind of thing. But the truth of the matter is, I said this to Michelle last night. Michelle is the finest first lady, in my view, that has ever served in the office. There's been other great first ladies, but I really genuinely mean it. Michelle's brother, um, and he told me about how you guys were raised, and I got to know and love your mom. If your mom were your mom 15 years older, she could have been my mom. I mean, literally, the way you were raised, the way we were raised, there wasn't any difference. And, um, and I knew that this decision to join you, which was the greatest honor of my life, um, was the right decision on the night we had to go and accept the nomination, the formal, um, be nominated at the convention. And Finnegan, who's now 18 years old, was then 10 years old. And she came to me and she said, Pop, is it okay if the room that, that we're in, Finnegan, Maisie, and Naomi, that we 
have the beds taken out. And I said, why? He said, maybe the Obama girls and your brother's children, maybe they would come down and all sleep together in sleeping bags. And I give him my word as a Biden. I knew when I left to go over to the convention, open that door and saw them cuddle together. I knew this was the right decision. I knew it was the right decision. I really did. Because, Mr. President, uh, the same value set. The same value set. Folks, uh, you know, I joke with my staff that I don't know why they pay them anything. Because they get to advise me. The president of the University of Delaware, where my heart resides in my home campus of Delaware, as he can tell you, um, it's uh, I get to give you advice. I get to be the last guy in the room and give you advice on the most difficult decisions anyone has to make in the whole world. But I get to walk out, and you make it all by yourself, all by yourself. Harry Truman was right about the buck stopping at the desk. And I've never, 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 never once doubted on these life and death decisions. I never once doubted that your judgment was flawed. Not once. Not once. We've disagreed and we've argued and we've raised our voices to one another, which we made a deal. We'd be completely open like brothers with one another. But, Mr. President, um, I've watched you under intense fire. I will venture to say that no president in history has had as many novel crises land on his desk in all of history, the Civil War was worse, the World War II was worse, World War I. But, Mr. President, almost every one of the crises you face was a case of first instance. A case of first instance. And I watched that prodigious mind and that heart as big as your head. I've watched you. I've watched how you've acted. When you see a woman or man under intense pressure, you get a measure, and you know that, Michelle. And your daughters know it as well. This is a remarkable man. And uh, I just hope that the asterisk in history that is attached to my name when they talk about this presidency is that I can say I was part of, part of the journey of a remarkable man who did remarkable things for this country. go by without quoting an Irish poet. <laughs> Jill and I talk about why you are able to develop the way you developed and with the heart you have. Michelle and I have talked about it. I've confided to Michelle. I've gone to her for advice. I've, we've talked about this man. You give me insight. And uh, I think it's because, Mr. President, you gave me credit for having understanding other people's misery and suffering. But Mr. President, um, there's not one single solitary ounce of entitlement in you, or Michelle, or your beautiful daughters. And you girls are incredible. You really are. 
It's not a it's not hyperbole, you really are. Not one ounce of entitlement. And Seamus Haney in one of his poems said <laughs> when you when you can when you can find someone who says it better, use it. He said, You carried your own burden and very soon your symptoms of creeping privilege disappeared. You carried your own burdens, and very soon the creeping symptoms of privilege disappeared. Mr. President, you have uh, sometimes been like a lone wolf, wolf, but you carried yourself in a way that is pretty remarkable. The history of the journey, your journey, is something people are going to write about in a long time. And I'm not being solicitous when I say this. And you're so fortunate, both of you, to have found each other. Because all that grounding, all that that you had, made this guy totally whole. And, um, pretty amazing. Mr. President, uh, um, this honor is, uh, is not only well beyond what I deserve, but it's a reflection of the extent and generosity of your spirit. I don't deserve this, but I know it came from the president's heart. There's a Talmudic saying that says, what comes from the heart enters the heart. Mr. President, you have creeped into our heart, you and your whole family, including mom, and you occupy it. It's an amazing thing that happened. I knew how smart you were. I knew how honorable you were. I knew how decent you were from the couple years you worked in the Senate. And I knew what you were capable of. But I never fully expected that you'd occupy the Biden's heart from Hunter, Ashley, my sister, all of us, all of us. And uh, Mr. President, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm indebted to you. I'm indebted to your friendship. I'm indebted to your family. And uh, as uh, I'll tell you, I'll end on a humorous note. We're having lunch, our lunches, and mostly, and it's, it's whichever in either one of our minds. We talk about family an awful lot. And about six months in, the president looked at me and said, You know, Joe, you know what surprised me? How we've become such good friends. <laughs> and I said, Surprised you? But that is candid Obama. <laughs> and it's real. And Mr. President, you know, as long as there's a breath in me, I'll be there for you. My whole family will be. And I know. I know it is uh, reciprocal. I, uh, and I want to thank you all so very, very, very much. All of you.